Hello, and welcome to Unworthy History. We try to bring you actual history on this channel, unlike other history channels you might have heard about. Now today I'm going to bring you more actual history from this very old book, uh, Indian Depredations in Texas by J.W. Wellbarker, published all the way back in 1889. Uh, now this story takes place in the late 1860s near Hamilton, uh, Texas. So this was really uh, somewhat kind of the edge of the Texas settlement. And this story is the story of a man named William Willis. Closely following the close of the war between the states and the dismantlement of the Confederate troops on the frontier, the thieving and murderous raids of our implacable foe, the Indian, became of monthly occurrence all along the Texas frontier. These raids were generally made about the time of the full moon and were more than usually frequent and barbarous in Hamilton County during the years of 1866 and 1867. During these years, the loss in horses especially was enormous. Settlements were scattering and few, and as Hamilton County was about the limit of their predatory incursions eastward, generally by keeping well concealed in the chaparral of the mountains, their presence was not known until they had mounted themselves upon fleet horses and the theft detected or a murder committed. After which, before a pursuing party could be organized, ten or twelve hours had often elapsed, giving the Indians much the start. After a short chase, night usually ended the pursuit till morning, thus another advantage was gained by the Indian. In 1866, John Hogue Pearson purchased a fine tract of land on the Leon River, about 10 miles east of the town of Hamilton, and he settled upon it, establishing there a large horse ranch. He had great experience in Indian warfare, having been on the frontier from boyhood to manhood. His father, J.G.W. Pearson, moved to Texas from Union County, Kentucky in 1822, when the son was but five years of age. In the spring of 1836, he shot a young chief, and in the August following was wounded in a battle on the Collettes. He realized the disadvantage the settlers labor, labored under in not being able to continue the pursuit at night, and to overcome this he obtained five noted and well-trained bloodhounds from Falls County, and turned over the management of them to his elder son, J.G.W. Pearson, then a lad of sixteen. He had one other son, Thomas C. Pearson, four years younger. On Christmas Eve, 1866, at about 9 o'clock, news was brought to Pearson's ranch that the Indians had shot Will Willis about sundown within sight of Captain J.M. Rice's, who lived south of the town of Hamilton, about three-fourths of a mile. None of the family were on the ranch except the elder son, John G.W., hastily procuring his gun and pistols, he mounted his favorite horse and sounding the call for the bloodhounds in 15 minutes from the time the news came, he was riding in a swift gallop by the nearest route over the prairies with a single companion towards the town of Hamilton. Wishing to have the dogs as fresh as possible when they should take the trail, they were not forced beyond a good running gait till the place where the shooting occurred was reached. This was, for once, on the dark of the moon. A high, cold wind came with freezing breath from the north. A dozen men joined young Pearson at Hamilton, and with scarcely a halt the dogs were taken to the trail, which these sagacious animals took with such a ferocious howl that each one instinctively tightened his grasp on his gun and straightened himself in his stirrups as the hot blood went tingling through his veins. The details of the shooting had not been told to young Pearson, for the runner sent for him had not been informed, and he had not taken the time to make any inquiries. To get on the trail was the first desire. As soon, however, as the dogs gave vent to such a howl of rage on taking the trail, Pearson said to the party, There is blood on this trail. Yes, said one. Willis said he was certain he hit the one who seemed to be the chief among the Indians, as he nearly fell from his horse when, he, when Willis fired. The dogs were soon in full pursuit, heading down Blue Ridge in southeast direction. These dogs were trained to yelp and trailing at long intervals. Young Pearson requested all the others to ride behind him, fearing that if they passed ahead, they might override the hounds. At that time and season of the year, the tall sedge grass brushed the stirrups of the riders and was considerably higher than the backs of the dogs and very thick. When about 15 miles had gone over and horses as well as dogs were 
giving evidence of fatigue. Suddenly the furious baying of the dogs convinced everyone that the Indians were overtaken. But young Pearson discovered something stretched upon the ground, and in the darkness, not unlike the figure of a man, his horse plunged about so he could not ride up to the thing, but dismounting and giving the rein to a comrade, he approached to find only a blanket of an Indian shield. These next morning were found to be covered with blood, and from the decorations and figures upon the shield, the conclusion was that young Willis had given an Indian of high degree his death wound, and that he had died where his blanket and shield were found. Another thing was made certain. The Indians had heard the pursuit and hastily departed with their dead. Will Willis was shot in the back with an arrow, the spike sticking into the spine. He was 23 or 24 years of age and the son of Robert Willis, who had moved there from South Arkansas and settled on the Lampasas back in 1855. There were 13 Indians in the party which attacked him. He was riding a small mule and was coming to town to attend a dance. Everybody in those days carried arms and he had a Spencer rifle. He was about a mile from Captain Rice's residence when he saw the Indians and attempted to run. Vain effort. He then dismounted and pushed on, leading his mule and protecting himself behind the animal, now and then pointing his gun at the enemy as they came nearer and nearer and circling around. Finally, his mule was so badly wounded with an arrow he had to abandon it. He was finally struck by an arrow from the bow of the Indian on the dun horse, supposed to be the chief. At this, Willis lost all patience and turned upon the unrelenting Indians, who were now pressing him closely. He knelt upon one knee and took such aim at the Indian riding the dun horse as was possible while he was dashing around him and fired. The Indian cried out and came near falling from his horse. Willis said he thought the Indian was tied onto the horse, for at the crack of his gun, the supposed chief gave vent to that peculiar cry or grunt, which signal generally indicates that an Indian has been hurt. The other Indians abandoned Willis and went to the supposed chief, and then rode rapidly off, leaving Willis and his mule, as it had subsequently proved, mortally wounded on the prairie. There were no men at Captain Rice's, and by the time the neighbors had been notified of Willis's fate, it was too dark to follow. So a runner was sent to Pearson's ranch for the bloodhounds. <clears throat> Willis's mule was found next morning in a corner of Captain Rice's fence, dead. Will Willis received every attention, but died at the residence of Dr. W.S. Walker in the town of Hamilton some three weeks afterward. So there we get the story of uh, Will Willis, and unfortunately, uh, he didn't survive this ordeal with Indians, although he seemed to have taken out uh, the chief, the, probably the person, uh, the one who shot him with an arrow uh, in the process, and that uh, forced them to flee. Uh, so that's it for this episode. So if you want to hear more episodes like this, then be sure to like and subscribe, and we'll see you next time here on Unworthy History.